following program does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the City of Oceanside, its elected officials, KOCT, its board of directors, or staff. Enjoy Professional Hair Care offers over 30 pH balanced and stable products designed to meet the needs of every hair type and delivers beautiful, healthy hair from start to finish. And just remember to enjoy. Welcome to the Voice of Oceanside. I'm your host, John Bonasaro, and in today's show, we'll learn about one of the busiest departments in the County of San Diego, the Aging and Independent Services Department. We'll accompany an ombudsman who checks in on the health and care of our senior citizens and learn about a growing problem, financial crimes against our seniors. Our guest is the director of the agency, Ellen Schmieding. Ellen, thanks for joining us on The Voice of Oceanside. Thank you for having me. How about giving us a briefing on the department, on what it does and how long it's been around and just some of the facts and figures. I certainly will. You know, our county agency is Aging and Independent Services. We're part of the larger Health and Human Services Agency and we're also an area agency on aging. There's about 640 area agency on aging throughout the nation and there are uniform services offered in many of these agencies. For example, we receive some of our services from the Older Americans Act, and we offer core programs like senior nutrition, family caregiver, care management, health promotion, and other services. In our agency, we also operate some large programs such as adult protective services, investigating abuse and neglect of older adults. Adult Protective Services serves clients in the community. In facilities such as skilled nursing facilities or board and cares, our long-term care ombudsman is the one that goes into these facilities. We also run a large program called in-home supportive services. We've got over 25,000 low-income individuals receiving in-home care from almost 22,000 home care workers in our community. We offer care management services, and that allows people to get some help with financial issues, linkage to a doctor, and other needs. And we're very proud of our community-based care transitions program. We operate with 13 hospitals in our region, 19,000 clients served. Our goal is to help people stay out of the hospital. When you get into the hospital, oftentimes you get a lot of conflicting information. You don't know how to stay out. You don't understand your medications or how to connect with a doctor. Our team, hospital and community-based social workers, work together to help the individual learn how to manage their own care. What, what is a region? A region um, in is terms it San of San Diego a, County. Our, ours is the County of San Diego. Here in California, there are area agencies. Some of them serve larger jurisdictions, multiple counties. We are so large in San Diego that we our agency serves the entire county. We don't have multiple area agencies here. So the services you talk about would be uniform throughout the county. They are. They are. We operate directly through our programs and we also have more than 90 contractors that provide services on our behalf. For example, 19 different nutrition contractors. So you can go to any number of centers across the county and get a good meal. For our clients that are at home and not able to get out, we also have home delivered meals. We operate the public administrator, public guardian, and public conservator programs for individuals with mental illness or dementia who need a guardian to assist them with their lives, and any number of other programs as well. Well, let's give uh, our viewers a flavor for one of them. It's okay. your in-house program, and your volunteer, Frank Gould, yes. um, was followed uh, for a day by our cameras, and we'll give our viewers a chance to look at that, okay. and then we can come back and talk about that and, and the other programs. Right. Um, you'll want to take a look at this. Uh, it, it's a brief video, and we'll see you back here. Hi, my name is Frank, and I'm a long-term ombudsman representative for the County of San Diego long-term care ombudsman program. The mission of the program states to advocate for the dignity and quality of life, care, and comfort for all long-term care residents 
in all long-term care facilities. Other than a small paid cadre, the San Diego Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program is populated and made possible by dedicated, volunteer, certified ombudsman representatives. These ombudsman representatives have undergone intense and rigorous training, interviews, on-the-job training, all to be completed satisfactorily before being certified. Today, as I speak, there are 70 ombudsman representatives in the county. I wish we had more. The county has licensed 90 skilled nursing facilities, S and F, SNFs in the trade, which in addition to offering living assistance, have on-site delivery of medical and nursing care. Additionally, the county has licensed 660 residential care facility for the elderly. These small residences have an average population of six and are known in the trade as six beds. You do the math, 90 plus 660, 750 facilities housing approximately 10 to 12,000 residents. That is why I say, I wish I could tell you we had 80 or 90 or 100 ombudsman representatives. Why don't you join us? We can use you. The residents can use you. The residents need you. And they are deserving of having representation to advocate on their behalf. In the past years, when we were younger, these residents stood tall for us. Let us stand tall for them. They may be old, they may be feeble, they have rights and these rights are not to be trampled on. And that is where we, Ombudsman representatives, the Ombudsman program comes into being. They have the right to privacy. They have the right of association to accept visitors or reject visitors. They have a right to have their mail delivered to them unopened. They have the right to see their doctors. They have the right to practice their religion. They have the right to complain to the Ombudsman Office, to licensing, to Adult Protective Services, to the sheriff if needed. Once these are made known to the various agencies, the Ombudsman representative will contact the resident and commence an investigation that will go forward only with the resident's or complainant's permission. These agencies have the authority and power to impose sanctions in the form of monetary fines, putting a facility on probation, revoking the license of a facility, preventing caregivers from ever working as caregivers again, preventing administrators from ever working as administrators again. There's also access to the Elder Abuse Division of the District Attorney's Office. So as you can see, long-term care residents are the focus of our attention. To put it in simple English, we, the Ombudsman Program, have their backs. I'm about to go in and make a monthly visit. I've been here many times. I believe in as many visits as possible in order to develop a rapport with the residents and to keep the staff on notice that someone does care for them. When I enter the house, I initiate what I call the smell test. Any odor of urine, however slight, ammonia, bleach, or heavy air-scented freshener sounds alarm bells and puts me on notice that hygiene might be lacking. I then walk through the house to inspect for cleanliness, to inspect for security, that is to make sure that the medication drawer is under lock and key. 
All medications are kept on the lock and key until presented to the residents per the doctor's schedule. Records are kept, these are also on the lock and key. All knives used in the kitchen are on the lock and key. In short, anything that could cause harm to a resident is placed outside of an area in which the resident might find him or herself. Then I will talk to the residents in private if need be and make some comments to the administrator if need be as to impressions that I have or hints of what she might do to make things a little better. And that's what I do. And that's what all ombudsman representatives do. We're here because long-term residents are here. Welcome back. Ellen, can you flesh out that program that Frank demonstrated to us a little I bit? I certainly can. We have the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. This is a federal program. We have a number of county staff that are involved, but mainly the work is done through volunteers. These are individuals who go through extensive training, and then they would like to go out and make a difference in our community by advocating for residents at skilled nursing facilities or residential care for the elderly. So a volunteer like Frank could have a number of different facilities that they go to regularly to check in with residents and make sure that their care needs are being met. They also investigate complaints that might be made by residents. And if it's an egregious offense, they try to get the resident's permission to cross report to state licensing and law enforcement. So their work is tremendously important. And just this year, our Board of Supervisors, led by uh, County Supervisor Diane Jacob and Greg Cox, supported our addition of a, uh, more staff for the Ombudsman Program. We had experienced severe state cuts and we've been able to double the number of staff and we're right now working to increase the number of volunteers in the program. Now, regarding maybe this uh, program and maybe programs in general. I don't know yet. Um, are these? Uh, is there? Is this an on-call situation where people um, request it, or are you going out on a regular basis and looking, or both? Both. both. In the ombudsman program, our staff and our volunteers respond to complaints or phone calls into the office. So they may hear somebody with a concern about the food that they're not able to have fresh hot food on a regular basis or they've asked for a diet change that has not been honored or perhaps they'd like an advanced directive witnessed. So that's something that can be scheduled and the individual or volunteer or staff member will get out there as quickly as they can for these efforts. However, if it's an abuse situation where the resident may have suffered an injury, uh, that's something they'll respond to right away. And however, they're also going out on a regular basis to see these facilities. They need to get out quarterly to visit those skilled nursing facilities and the residential care for the elderly facilities, two different types of care that's provided. How do people know they have this available to them? Well, one of the great things about ombudsman is there is a required poster in every facility that, that provides our phone number and how to reach us in the event of a concern. So anyone that walks into any of these facilities, be they family members or a resident, will see our phone number and understand they have rights that need to be protected. Do you think the word is getting out sufficiently? You know, there's always room for improvement. Again, thanks to our county board, we've been able to increase the number of staff. That makes a difference in our ability to support all the volunteers we need to get into all these facilities. Believe it or not, there's about 90 plus skilled nursing facilities and another 600 plus residential care for the elderly or board and cares. So that is a lot of ground to cover for our volunteers and it requires a tremendous amount of work and dedication on, the, on behalf of our staff and volunteers. 
So I'm, I'm hearing there's a high level of interaction between your, your staff and your volunteer staff in these facilities. That must lead to the ability of you to make a judgment as to where they're at in terms of quality. And just, do you have a rating system? You know, I'm glad you asked that, John. This is an exciting time for us where, again, back to our Board of Supervisors who has been so supportive of the work we're doing. Diane Jacob, County Supervisor, asked that in conjunction with Greg Cox and the District Attorney, Bonnie Dumanis, came together to ask for increased efforts for safety in these facilities. And our District Attorney began a special prosecution unit to try to uh, bring perpetrators of abuse in these facilities to justice. And we were asked to create a rating system for residential care for the elderly the first of its kind in California. So we're just getting ready to sign a contract with a community-based provider who will help us pilot a voluntary rating system for residential care for the elderly or board and cares, sometimes known as assisted living. So we are try working with 18 facility volunteers. We're going to be uh, designing the rating system, piloting it, and then hoping to roll it out later this year. Ellen, I want to hear a little bit more about this because it sounds really important and necessary. It's time for our break. Okay. Um, we're going to be stepping aside here for a minute or two. Stay with us and we will be back to talk more about the important issue of elder abuse scams and other issues that involve our seniors. Since 1906, our city's safety and security has been provided by the Oceanside Police. Their motto is service with pride and they demonstrate this each day by building trust and providing quality service to our community. The Oceanside Police Department, committed to protecting our city and ensuring a safe and healthy Oceanside. Hi, welcome back to the Voice of Oceanside and our guest, Ellen Schmieding, the director for the county's Department of Aging and Independence Services. Ellen, we were just talking before the break about a rating system for facilities. Right. It's not available yet. When can people expect to see this and how do they find out about it? Good. Thank you for asking, John. You know, we're, we're right now piloting the rating system with a community-based provider. We hope to sign the contract here in the next week or so. They have six months to pilot the rating system with 18 volunteer facilities. At the end of that six-month period, we expect to be able to roll out the rating system, and we hope to bring many of the residential care facilities on board with this new system. We will have a website that's easily accessible, and we'll be promoting that website throughout our community community so that anyone looking for a facility for themselves or their loved one will know exactly how to find us. It almost sounds, and I hope this is the case, that the facilities are in a way partnering with you on this. That is one of the best things about this project. We've had 18 facilities come forward and ask to partner with us on this. In setting up the event, we taught, we had a uh, town hall meeting that was both virtual and in person, and we reached out to all 600 plus facilities to invite them to participate. So many are waiting to see what comes of it, uh, but others have stepped right up to the plate to help us design something that will not only meet the consumer's needs, but also give facilities a chance to profile what they're good at. Very good. I mean, you could almost say that's the rating system in and of itself who steps forward to volunteer. Well, it's, <laughs> if you're not listed, you're going to be a little more difficult to find. Okay. Now, I understand there's also an initiative to do with Alzheimer's. That's true. You know, last year, Supervisor Diane Jacob was our chairperson. And in her state of the county, she made it very clear that the Alzheimer's issue would be her top priority. And she then went forward with full board of supervisors support to launch the Alzheimer's project. That was an exciting year that culminated in a conference held last December. And we just approved our implementation plan March 17th. The effort is focused on six different areas. One of the most important is bringing together many partners, including the mayor of San Diego, as well as noted researchers, philanthropic figures like Darlene Shiley, the Alzheimer's Association, physicians, and our community to work on some core issues. Number one being the search for a cure. Very few communities have the number of noted scientists that we do in San Diego. These individuals have come together to talk about finding a cure. There's fundraising going on even as we speak. 
to help identify funding, to bring real promising drugs forward quickly to distribution. That's always been one of the big hangups is the amount of time it takes between those two elements. So that's at the top of the priority listing. Also important is the development of clinical standards to diagnose, screen, and treat Alzheimer's that we hope that every physician will use in our community. That effort is being led by Drs. Lobatz and Dr. Nikki Fentides and is very, very promising. I'm involved as well in the care elements that are working to support persons with dementia as well as their caregivers. We've got a public awareness arm raising awareness about the illness, what people can do to recognize it and get care for themselves and support groups for family. We also have efforts around legislation to try to look for legislative areas for additional support as well as funding. We're, we're trying to identify as much funding as we can to move this very audacious implementation plan forward. I'm assuming early detection is going to be part of this. It is and we just recently learned from some research that was done that fully 50% of physicians do not notify their family members of the, uh, the, the individual of the diagnosis, not the family or the individual. So one of our big efforts is to work with physicians. Oftentimes they are not aware of the resources that exist to help families and the individual and we're trying to support those doctors in helping to make that diagnosis as early as possible. The earlier, the better. There are treatments that help to keep the illness where it's at, and there's also an opportunity to bring in supports and give the individual the chance to plan for their lives and how they would like them to proceed with that illness. If somebody viewing has a suspicion, either for themselves, which I, I guess wouldn't be the norm, or someone close to them, what source do you recommend they visit first? Is it the family doctor, or do you have a resource center? You know, I, I honestly think it is a discussion with the doctor. They're going to be doing some screening, some perhaps ordering some cognitive tests, perhaps ordering some different types of scans that may be necessary, having discussions about behaviors that the individual may be seeing or family may be seeing. It's always wise to start with that doctor, but what we'd like to do is help that doctor in their practice to have uh, access to the resources that the family will need. When they walk out of that office, sometimes it's a shock and they may have suspected something was going on with the illness, but they then have to face that on a day-to-day -day basis and they need a lot of support. That's where our community partners like Alzheimer's Association, Southern Caregiver, the Glenner Center, and many other partners come together to try to provide that support and assistance to the individual and their family. This sounds like it might be a pilot program for the nation. Is, is it that leading edge? I believe it is, and I think what makes it so significant is the bringing together of all the dimensions. The coalescing of our community across so many different dimensions is what makes it very special. And I do think the motivation for the cure, seeing these very high level researchers from competing organizations come together with a unified voice, having philanthropic figures like Darlene Shiley support the effort, having a steering committee that includes the sheriff, the mayor, Supervisor Jacob, Mary Ball of the Alzheimer's Association, our director, Nick Machione. These are strong figures, including Dr. Lobatz, who is leading the clinical uh, effort for the physicians. It's a very exciting convening of some of the greatest minds and persons in our community to address it. You know, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I think in addition to the center being a center for the, for the cure, obviously we have a large retirement community in San Diego as That's well. Right. So you have really both sides of the picture. So it's very That's appropriate. Right. Good. Good. Um, we've got about five minutes left okay. and I, I want to address the issue um, of scams against seniors, which are, I mean, any scam is, is a, a problem, but it seems particularly notorious because this preys on those least able to defend themselves yeah. and of course financially recover from them because the time's just not there. So um, tell us about your involvement in that and your organization's involvement and let's see if in the time less, 
left, we can get out as much warning information okay. as we can. I'd like to do that. Thank you so much. You know, scams have been a big concern of ours for quite some time. At Adult Protective Services, fully half of our referrals, we get about 12,500 reports of abuse annually. About half of them contain an allegation of financial abuse. A lot of the issues that we're seeing have to do with these scams perpetrated against older adults. And we have partnered with our district attorney, once again, the leadership of uh, Supervisor Diane Jacob, joining with Bonnie Dumanis, our DA, looking how can we address the scams in our community? How can we do this? One of the issues that, that confronts people is a series of different approaches that are taken. You either are owed money, you, uh, you yourself owe money, or somebody you love needs money. So it variations on a theme. Scammers are hard to catch, so our efforts are really designed around education. Scams are picking up steam, and one of the most common these days has to do with the grandparent scam. That's, if you can imagine, uh, we're sitting at home, and grandma gets a phone call. Guess who this is? And grand, grandmother, grandfather is guessing, you know, is this Bob, is this Kay, who is this? And as soon as they hit on a name, this guy, oh yeah, it's, it's Kay, that's who's on the line. And I'm in a jail and I need you to bail me out. Please don't tell mom and dad, they'd be shocked and upset. Can I count on you to send me money right away via wire transfer or a green dot card so that I can get out of jail right now? And the, one of the key elements is they say, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody, I'm so ashamed, I don't want this to get out. Just in the last year, we had uh, a former prosecutor's mother scammed out of $60,000 in this fashion. A retired priest was scammed out of 40,000 through a lottery scam. So these scams are picking up steam like you would not believe. And the scammer doesn't ever have to rob the person face to face. A lot of what's done is done over the phone, via email, letters, lottery, sweepstakes offers. It's insidious, and so it, we're really doing all we can to raise awareness. This green dot situation is a, a real problem, and what happens is these are cards that you can pick up at any number of establishments. The individual uh, is told, go load money on the card, call me, scrape off the number on the back, read it to me, the card is immediately drained. It's not connected with the bank account and there is no recourse whatsoever to get that money back. So uh, ju we just came off of tax season, a lot of IRS scams calling the person to say, well, you have a refund coming, just send me $10,000 and I'll release a, a significant check to you for 15,000 or some variation on the scam saying, if you don't pay me immediately, we're coming to your home to arrest you for income tax fraud. So the creativity and the ability to come up with new scams every day is of grave concern. We're getting ready to release a toolkit in mid-May to address the scam issue. Will that be uh, like website access where the latest scams are posted? It will, and it will be something we'll put in the hands of many of our community partners as well as older adults and we'll focus on tips and things they need to be aware of. I think one of the most significant areas is if anybody is pressuring you, the important thing to do is slow down. Anybody that wants you to do anything, run to the bank, run to the get a green dot card, take your time, stop, think about it. People are approaching you on the phone, they're approaching you by mail or email. If you do not know who's calling, and of course everybody needs call waiting. That's one of the ways to deter that fraud right up front is to look and see who's calling. If you don't know, you don't pick it up. Uh, or you get an email. Do not respond if you don't know the person. Likewise, something in the mail. Talk to a trusted friend, family member, and really probe and inquire, is this does this seem right? Why am I under such pressure? You know, we're going to have to end this because of time, but that is really good advice, and I want to drive home. We're not just talking now to the potential victims, we're talking to family of victims. Right. So even if you think you're immune, your elders may not be for exactly. various reasons. Exactly, and I do want to throw out our 1-800 number, easy to remember, 1-800-510-2020. Our website, 
www.safeseniorssandiego.org. Also, law enforcement. If an individual feels that this has happened, they need to report it and try to get help right away. And we can assist, too, with providing resources and information. Helen, thanks for joining us. This is great information. Obviously, there's more to cover, and we'd like to see you back on The Voice of Oceanside. And thank you for watching The Voice of Oceanside. As you can see, a great way to stay connected to your North County community is to stay tuned to KOCT, your community channel. Remember, you can watch all of our local programming as video on demand by going to KOCT.org. You can also subscribe to our weekly blog, Community Connection, check our program schedule, and watch City Council and Hospital Board meetings. Thanks for watching.